Peter and Wendy, Chapter 11, Wendy's Story. Listen, then, said Wendy, settling down to her story with Michael at her feet and the seven boys in the bed. There was once a gentleman. I had rather he had been a lady, Curly said. I wish he had been a white rat, said Nibs. Quiet, their mother admonished them. There was a lady also, and... Oh, Mummy, cried the first twin. You mean that there is a lady also, don't you? She is not dead, is she? Oh, no. I am awfully glad she isn't dead, said Toodles. Are you glad, John? Of course I am. Are you glad, Nibs? Rather. Are you glad, twins? We are just glad. Oh, dear, sighed Wendy. Little less noise there, Peter called out, determined that he should have fair play, however beastly a story he, it might be in his opinion. The gentleman's name, Wendy continued, was Mr. Darling, and her name was Mrs. Darling. I knew them, John said, to annoy the others. I think I knew them, said Michael, rather doubtfully. They were married, you know, explained Wendy, and what do you think they had? White rats, cried Nibs, inspired. No. It's awfully puzzling, said Toodles, who knew the story by heart. Quiet, Toodles. They had three descendants. What is descendants? Well, you are one, twin. Do you hear that, John? I am a descendant. Descendants are only children, said John. Dear, oh dear, oh dear, sighed Wendy. Now these three children had a faithful nurse called Nana, but Mr. Darling was angry with her and chained her up in the yard, and so all the children flew away. It's an awfully good story, said Nibs. They flew away, Wendy continued, to the Neverland, where the lost children are. I just thought they did, Curly broke in excitedly. I don't know how it is, but I just thought they did. Oh, Wendy, cried Toodles. Was one of the lost children called Toodles? Yes, he was. I am in a story. Hurrah! I am in a story, Nibs. Hush. Now I want you to consider the feelings of the unhappy parents with all their children flown away. Oh, they all moaned, though they were not really considering the feelings of the unhappy parents one jot. Think of the empty beds. Oh, it's awfully sad, the first twin said cheerfully. I don't see how it can have a happy ending, said the second twin. Do you, Nibs? I'm frightfully anxious. If you knew how great a mother's love is of mother's love, Wendy told them triumphantly, you would have no fear. She had now come to the part that Peter hated. I do like a mother's love, said Toodles, hitting Nibs with a pillow. Do you like a mother's love, Nibs? I do just, said Nibs, hitting back. You see, said Wendy complacently, our heroine knew the mother would always leave the window open for her children to fly back, so they stayed away for years and had a lovely time. Did they ever go back? Let us now, said Wendy, bracing herself for the finest effort, take a peep into the future. And they all gave themselves the twist that makes peeps into the future easier. Years have rolled by. And who is this elegant lady of uncertain age alighting at London Station? Oh, Wendy, who is she? cried Nibs, every bit as excited as if he didn't know. Can it be? Yes, no, it is the fair Wendy. Oh, and who are the two noble portly figures accompanying her now grown to a man's estate? Can they be John and Michael? They are. Oh, see, dear brothers, said Wendy, pointing upward. There is the window still standing open. Ah, we are, now we are rewarded for our sublime faith in a mother's love. So up they flew to their mummy and daddy, and pen cannot describe the happy scene over which we draw a veil. That was the story, and they were pleased with it, as the fair, narr as the fair narrator herself. Everything just as it should be, you see. Off we skip like the most heartless things in the world, which is what children are but so attractive, and we have an entirely selfish time, and then when we have need of special attention, we nobly return for it, 
confident that it shall be embraced instead of smacked. So great indeed was their faith in a mother's love that they felt they could afford to be callous for a bit longer. But there was one there who knew better, and when Wendy finished he uttered a hollow groan. What is it, Peter? she cried, running to him, thinking he was ill. She felt him solicitously, lower down than his chest. Where is it, Peter? It isn't that kind of pain, Peter replied darkly. Then what kind is it? Wendy, you are wrong about mothers. They all gathered round him in a fright. So alarming was his agitation, and with a fine candor he told them what he had hitherto concealed. Long ago, he said, I thought, like you, that my mother would always keep the window open for me. So I stayed away for moons and moons and moons, and then flew back. But the window was barred, for mother had forgotten all about me, and there was another little boy sleeping in my bed. I'm not sure that this was true, but Peter thought it was true, and it scared them. Are you sure mothers are like that? Yes. So this was the truth about mothers. The toads. Still, it is best to be careful, and no one knows so quickly as a child when he should give in. Wendy, let us go home, cried John and Michael together. Yes, said she, clutching them. Not tonight, asked the lost boys, bewildered. They knew in what they called their hearts that one can get on quite well without a mother, and that it is only the mothers who think you can't. At once, replied resolutely, for the horrible thought had come to her, perhaps mother is in half mourning by this time. This dread made her forgetful of what must be Peter's feelings, and she said to him rather sharply, Peter, will you make the necessary arrangements? If you wish it, he replied as coolly as if she had asked him to pass the nuts. Not so much as a sorry to lose you between them. If she did not mind the parting, he was going to show her was Peter that neither did he. But of course he cared very much. And he was so full of wrath against grown-ups, who as usual were spoiling everything, that soon he got inside his tree where he breathed intentionally quick short breaths at the rate of about five to a second. He did this because it was the saying in Neverland that every time you breathe a grown-up dies and Peter was killing them off vindictively as fast as possible. Then, having given the necessary instructions to the Redskins, he returned to the home, where an unworthy scene had been enacted in his absence. Panic-stricken at the thought of losing Wendy, the lost boys had advanced upon her threateningly. "'It will be worse than before she came,' they cried. "'We shan't let her go. Let's keep her prisoner. I chain her up!' In her extremity, an instinct told her which of them to turn to. "'Toodles!' she cried. I appeal to you. Was it not strange? She appealed to Toodles, quite the silliest one. Grandly, however, did Toodles respond. For that one moment, he dropped his silliness and spoke with dignity. I am just Toodles, he said, and nobody minds me. But the first who does not behave to Wendy like an English gentleman, I will blood him severely. He drew his hanger, and for that instant the sun was at noon. The others held back uneasily. Then Peter returned, and he saw at once they would get no support from him. He would keep no girl in the Neverland against her will. Wendy, he said, striding up, or striding up and down, I have asked the Redskins to guide you through the wood as flying tires you sow. Thank you, Peter. Then, he continued in the short, sharp voice of one accustomed to be obeyed, Tinkerbell will take you across the sea. Wake her, Nibs. Nibs had to knock twice before he got an answer, though Tink had really been sitting up in bed listening for some time. "'Who are you? How dare you? Go away!' she cried. "'You are to get up, Tink,' Nibs called, and take Wendy on a journey. Of course, Tink had been delighted to hear that Wendy was going, but she was jolly well determined not to be her courier, and she said so in still more offensive language. Then she pretended to be asleep again. She says she won't, Nids exclaimed, aghast at such insubordination. 
whereupon Peter went sternly toward the young lady's chamber. Tink, he rapped out, if you don't get up and dress at once, I will open the curtains, and then we shall all see you in your negligee. This made her leap to the floor. Who said I wasn't getting up? she cried. In the meantime, the boys were gazing forlornly at Wendy, now equipped with John and Michael for the journey. By this time they were dejected, not merely because they were about to lose her, but also because they felt that she was going off to something nice to which they had not been invited. Novelty was beckoning to them as usual. Crediting them with nobler feeling, Wendy melted. Dear ones, she said, if you will all come with me, I feel almost sure I can get my father and mother to adopt you. The invitation was meant specifically for Peter, but each of the boys was thinking exclusively of himself, and at once they jumped with joy. But won't they think us rather a handful? Nibs asked in the middle of his jump. Oh no, said Wendy, rapidly thinking it out. It will only mean having a few beds in the drawing room, and they can be hidden against the screens on first Thursdays. Peter, can we go? they all cried imploringly. They took it for granted that if they went, he would also go. But really, they scarce, he, but really, they scarcely cared. Thus children are ever ready when novelty knocks to desert their dearest ones. All right, Peter replied with a bitter smile and immediately they rushed to get their things. And now, Peter, Wendy said, thinking she had put everything right, I'm going to give you your medicine before you go. She loved to give them medicine, and undoubtedly gave them too much. Of course, it was only water, but it was out of a calabash, and she always shook the calabash and counted the drops, which gave it a certain medicinal quality. On this occasion, however, she did not give Peter his draught, for just as she had prepared it, she saw a look on his face that made her heart sink. Get your things, Peter, she cried, shaking. No, he answered, pretending indifference. I am not going with you, Wendy. Yes, Peter. No. To show that her departure would leave him unmoved, he skipped up and down the room, playing gaily on his heartless pipes. She had to run after him, though it was rather undignified. To find your mother, she coaxed. Now, if Peter had ever quite had a mother, he no longer missed her. He could do very well without one. He had thought them out and remembered only their bad points. No, no, he told Wendy decisively. Perhaps she would say I was old and I just want always to be a little boy and to have fun. But Peter, no. And so the others had to be told. Peter isn't coming. Peter not coming. They gazed blankly at him. There's sticks over their backs, and on each stick a bundle. Their first thought was that if Peter was not going, he had probably changed his mind about letting them go. But he was far too proud for that. If you find your mothers, he said darkly, I hope you will like them. The awful cynicism of this made an uncomfortable impression and most of them began to look rather doubtful. After all, their faces said, were they not noodles to want to go? Now then, cried Peter, no fuss, no blubbering. Goodbye, Wendy. And he held out his hand cheerily, quite as if they must really go now, for he had something important to do. She had to take his hand, as there was no indication that he would prefer Thimble. You still remember about changing your flannels, Peter? she said, lingering over him. She was always so particular about their flannels. Yes. And you will take your medicine? Yes. That seemed to be everything, and an awkward pause followed. Peter, however, was not the kind that breaks down before people. Are you ready, Tinkerbell? he called out. Aye, aye. Then lead the way. Tink darted up the nearest tree, but no one followed her, for it was at this moment that the pirates made their dreadful attack upon the redskins. Above, where all had been so still, the air was rent with shrieks and the clash of steel. Below, there was dead silence. Mouths opened and remained open. Wendy fell on her knees, but her arms were extended towards Peter. All arms were extended to him, 
as if suddenly blown in his direction. They were beseeching him mutely not to desert them, and Peter seized his sword, the same sword he thought he had slain Barbecue with, and the lust of battle was in his eye.